All right. Bad news. If you're watching from home, I forgot the microphone. So uh, I'll try to repeat any comments or questions or summarize them and repeat them. Uh, we're in Proverbs 30 tonight. So let's turn there. And I couldn't remember whether we did verse 10 or not. So somebody's going to have to help me. Did we talk about do not malign a servant to his master? I didn't think so, but I couldn't remember. All right. So do not malign a servant to his master, lest he curse you and you be found guilty. What's the point of that proverb? What was the last part? Okay. Yeah. And, you know, this is kind of an American pastime. <laughs> and especially with the anonymity of the Internet and Google reviews and all kinds of different reviews you can do. Uh, I think it's, it's one that's worth coming back and, and rethinking a little bit. Um, it doesn't mean that you can't or shouldn't. Uh, just go to an employer if a servant has done something wrong, does it? No. So what what what's the operative word here, do you think? Okay, slander. Or mine says malign. Slander I think is better. We probably better grasp on slander. So what is slander? What okay, yeah, it, it's it's attached to falsehood. So it's not it, this isn't just saying, you know, somebody I had bad service, I want to talk to the manager. So it's the same. It's when you embellish it or when there's no substance to the complaint and it a lot of times is motivated by some personal vendetta, some personal uh, gripe that you have with that person or conflict that you have with them and you think, oh, I know how I'll get back with them, get back at them. I'll go to their, their employer. I'll, I'll go in and tell their employer they did thus and so. And here, it, it doesn't link it directly back to God. It says, instead, lest he curse you and you be found. Why would the master curse you and you be found guilty? Okay, so how does he know that? Okay. The... Good. This this takes for takes kind of for granted that the master is uh, well informed and knows his his servants or knows his employees. I had this happen years ago where somebody wanted to complain about somebody that was under under me uh, that I was managing. And I said, oh, well, let's get them in here because I, I, that doesn't sound like them. And, of course, they go, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Wait until I leave. I don't, no, no, no. We're going to do this all together. And, of course, it came out that it wasn't, it wasn't uh, true. And why, what, what kind of application besides the practical can we make of this? Okay, good. That's a what that's not what i was thinking but that's awesome that's very good how we can complain to god about other people boy lord i want to pray i'm, I'm praying for so and so because you know how they do me and you know, a lot of times god says well maybe we need to pray for you and you need to go love so and so or serve so and so and quit being a so and so <laughs> okay good very good barbara what else This kind of sounds like uh, Satan going to God over Job, doesn't it? He goes to uh, to God and, and maligns Job and uh, then demands to basically, the, the phrase isn't used in Job, it's used about Peter later, but to sift Job like wheat. And um, 
and Satan was found guilty. I mean, he was wrong about Job. And he, Satan still does this. He goes and maligns us uh, to God. And if we're walking in the spirit, if we're with the Lord, then uh, you know, there's no cause for those to land, uh, you know, to land on us. It, 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 we prove them untrue by our conduct. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, it's a good illustration to, or a good, good connection to. Anyone else? Yeah, very good. Uh, it connects with a, a verse I mentioned kind of in passing Sunday morning, Romans 14, 4. Uh, it says we, we, we don't have the, the right as believers to judge another man's servant. And in the context there, it's talking about everybody serves the Lord. As, as believers, we all serve the Lord. And it, it doesn't mean it, it removes all those earthly authorities that God has placed, but we have to be careful about calling into into uh, uh, putting under. Uh, I can't speak tonight. Calling into judgment another another believer. We have to be careful with that. Doesn't mean we can't approach him again. It doesn't mean we can't talk to him. But it, that goes back more to what Barb says: is you go to the master and malign uh, a fellow believer. We have to be very cautious with that, lest we be found guilty. Anyone else? Comments or questions on 10? All right, 11 through 14. There is a generation that curses its father. Oh, you know what? Before we do this, let's step back to verse 1 for just a second because Carol and I looked, talked about this when we got home. Uh, remember last week in verse 1, we had that whole different translation yeah. Okay, so somebody had the notation that it was the Masoretic text, and what the Masoretic text is, is the, uh, the, the Hebrew text, or the ancient Hebrew text. And so what we found out as we looked at it a little deeper is Ithiel and Eucal in, the, in, in some texts, like the New King James and the King James, it, they're translated as names. The text that you had is what those two names mean. So that's why there's a difference. Some Hebrew rabbis and scholars tr treat it as though it's talking about being, can you, you read the, what that says again? Mine says, I'm talking about 30. 30 verse one. Okay, mine says, I am weary, O God, I am weary. Yeah, so Ithiel means weary, and you call means cast down or worn out. So, some treat it as names, and the reason they treated them as names is because there is another Ithiel in Scripture. So there's precedent there for there being a name, Ithiel, which means weary. And so some, some, some translators chose to view these as two names, that Agar is... Um, that, that Agar declared these things to, that he declared to them, to Ithiel and Eucal. The other translations say Ithiel or Agar just said, I'm weary and <laughs> And so they're both valid translations, but it does cause uh, the, the concern I had, as Carol and I talked about it, that we both had was the lack of notations in, in most Bibles recognizing the other translation or where they, where they come up with that. Uh, I have a study Bible doesn't say anything about the alternate translation, but there's obviously several translations that translate it just like the one that Jennifer and Carol have, which I think was the ESV. Uh, it, it's not a wrong translation, I think is why I wanted to come back to it, because I think we kind of left and said, oh, so is it a wrong translation, bad translation? It's not. It's just, it's an alternative translation 
that really is an alternative. It, it's just taking it as either saying, here's how I feel, or here's who I talked to. Uh, so anyway, I wanted to come back and touch on that. I just about forgot about it. So. Uh, cast down or um, worn out. Yeah, thank you. It could be unworthy. I mean, there'd be a variety of words you could use, but they all have that same idea of being uh, of being dejected or, or cast down. Unworthy would be good. Or they use the translation of the name. Yes. Hey, yeah. okay. so there you go. That was our date night. We had a deep dive into the Hebrew. <laughs> All right, 11 through 14 go together. And this is, uh, I think, a powerful set of verses. I think of this verse, the set often. I have thought of it often at different times in the culture wars and what goes on in the culture. And uh, obviously hitting it again at this time, it, it really, I think, resonates. There is a generation that curses its father and does not bless its mother. There's a generation that is pure in its own eyes, yet is not washed from its filthiness. There is a generation, oh, how lofty are their eyes and their eyelids are lifted up. There is a generation whose teeth are like swords and whose fangs are like knives to devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among men. All right, let's talk about these for a bit because I think these are this is an important passage of scripture for not just our our culture today, our generation right now, but as we can look back and see it many times over. What's it mean there is a generation, do you think? Okay, there's a kind of man. Um, I don't have a problem with that translation. The I, I, I lean towards liking the generation because it doesn't, that seems like it excludes women and children. And as a generation, it's pervasive. Okay, there are those, good. Some people, okay. What else? Yeah, I think that there are some some people I think is is good. I mean, it's fine because there's always these elements. There are always these elements in any generation, any given time. You're going to find somebody that doesn't honor their parents. And that's really what oh, I already flubbed up. I was going to ask you what that's talking about. Verse 11 is talking about that commandment. You shall honor your father and your mother that that refuse to honor their parents, not just as children, because honor towards your parents goes beyond childhood we have a responsibility to honor our parents through our lifetime and of course the question is always as well what if my parents were were jerks or what if they were bad parents or what if they were abusive uh you pray to the lord and find a way to honor them it doesn't mean you have to excuse the things they did or validate the things they did but you go before the lord and find what and what way can i honor in what way can I honor God's word by honoring my parents, even though they failed me here or uh, what have you? Uh, it's it's a very uh, pointed passage of scripture that's repeated, not just in the Old Testament law, but is carried over into the New Testament. Honor, honor our parents. So we find a way to do it. Uh, so there's always going to be, though, an element of people or some people that, that are not going to honor their parents their parents. There's always going to be some that are pure in their own eyes, but aren't washed from their filthiness. So there's always some. The reason I think generation is the intention here, of course, is in part due to the, the language, but also because we have periods in biblical history as well as in different cultures in, in human history. Biblical history is human history, but you understand what I mean where it becomes title, I guess, if you will. Uh, it, it's generational. It, it, it catches up, if not everybody, almost everybody. What are some periods in biblical history where that happens? Where it uses terms like everybody or everyone. Okay. 
in the time of the judges, we have uh, three or three or four times it explicitly says that in those days there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And so even then there were some people that were, were righteous. <laughs> the people at home are getting my hands right in their face. <laughs> uh, there, there are people that were righteous and we know that because we have people like Samuel's parents and we have people like Samson's parents uh, and then we have the judges that raise up. Uh, so we know there are people that did right, but for the most part, it was overwhelmingly uh, arrogant and uh, self-centered. What else? Where else? Anywhere else? Okay, the days of Noah. In the days of Noah, the, uh, the intent of man's heart was only evil all the time. That's pretty strong. I mean, so, so much so that it, it moved God to destroy the earth by flood. And so those are probably the two most prominent, although you can also find it in the periods of the kings, both of Israel and Judah, where you also have not just the kings, but the people following suit. Uh, oftentimes the king setting the tone, setting the precedent, and then the people following after un into unrighteousness. So we can look back in in different places in our world. When we were in Israel, we got to go to the Holocaust Museum in Israel, which is, you know, pretty sobering, you know, to be there in that land and and just know, you know, we, we went to the one that was here in Kansas City, the, the traveling exhibition last year, which is in uh, conjunction with Yad Vashem, which is who uh, did the Holocaust Museum in Israel. So a lot of similarities, same books and literature at the gift shop and things like that. But being there, you know, knowing that this was a dagger aimed by Satan at the heart of the Jews in much the same way Haman uh, was determined to destroy the Jews uh, in uh, Esther's day. Uh, that's the same kind of thing. You had a generation of Germans and others, uh, Italians and, and other you know, nations, certainly the Germans, uh, as far as between exterminating the Jews, uh, that were that this fits. Uh, they were they were pursuing uh, their own motives, their own pride, and uh, were were spiritually led astray. Yeah. Yes. Well, that's what I said earlier. There's elements of it in every generation, but what? So so that's what I'm driving at. You have it in every generation has elements of it. What, what causes it to go over the top? That's where I'm driving it. What causes it to be uh, judges level or German level uh, or Noah level, you know, the times of Noah level? What, what, what causes that, you think? Uh, okay, Satan is instigating uh, a lot of this. How do we know that? Okay, all of these things are rebellion. Every one of them will go down through them and uh, curses his father and mother. Well, that's rebellion against a direct commandment of God to honor your parents. Is is pure in its own eyes and not washed from its filthiness. What is that? It, how would we how would we term that? If we were put a Okay, that's exactly what I have written down, Barbara. Arrogance and unrighteousness. Just an, an arrogance, uh, like Psalm 2, why did the nations rage? Uh, you know, telling God, or, or in, in uh, the Psalms where it says, that the, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God, or literally no God. Uh, so this, this uh, out of control arrogance. There's a generation of how lofty are their eyes, and their eyelids are lifted up. What's that talking about? Pride, that's exactly right. Uh, pride, which is, you know, a diametrically opposed to God. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Uh, pride is that sin, fundamental sin of Satan. I will lift myself, I will exalt myself above the most high God. Uh, whose teeth are like swords, and his fangs are like knives. What's, what is that talking about? 
Okay, it may it may have to do with language, with tongues, with and not speaking in tongues, but, but the way we use the tongue. How much have we seen in Proverbs about the tongue? How much are we seeing right now that involves language, whether it's with the tongue or whether it's coming through the fingertips on, on the social media and things like that? And this is such an apt description of so much that goes on on social media or on the news uh it, it rips and tears and and seeks to destroy someone through words and then to devour the poor of the earth and needy from among men what, what would that be uh, say again greed yeah greed and uh just a, a lack of compassion which is another thing that we've seen in the book of proverbs is how much every one of these I think one of the reasons this, this passage is so important is every one of these statements is well covered in the book of Proverbs. It, it's not, this isn't, in other words, this is not the only set of verses that's going to talk about pride. It's not the only set of verses that talks about uh, obeying or honoring parents. It, it's certainly not the only set of verses that talks about uh, being greedy or being uncaring towards uh, the poor. We've seen so much of that as we've walked through the Proverbs. And so it's fitting that it would be here at the end that there is a generation, whether it be elements of a generation or whether it's a generation that, it, or, or, or it's, it's, uh, it's individuals in the generation that's, that are gathering steam and gathering people to cause a generational shift in a society, a country or culture, or even in the world that would cause it to, uh, to take on all these attributes. And because these have been so well um, talked about by God, if they take these attributes on, they're well positioned to be in opposition to God. Yeah, you're exactly right. Yeah, and it, they used they use all of these things, and um, especially we go down to verse uh, fourteen, and one of the key things that the uh, the Germans used, uh, and and you know when it started, it, you know I say with Germans. Let me make clear: I'm not saying that all Germans were on board with this to begin with. This was a propaganda campaign and one of the things they effectively used was the press i mean we think this is new you know the press it's not new it's just globalized now uh germany was using the national press very effectively all the way back uh in the 20s and 30s when nazism was was taking shape and so they they regularly portrayed as we went through the the different exhibits portrayed the, the Jews with horns on their head and their tails and big noses. And they were always fat and slovenly. And the, and the, the German was, you know, blonde haired and blue eyed and well, you know, fit and, and uh, industrious. And, uh, they had, you know, so many examples in, in books and in newspapers and magazines and things like that, that were designed to, uh, portray the Jews in this way, and then to take the economic uh, hardships that had come because of the Great Depression and say it's the, it's the fault of these Jews who control a lot of the finances and who are in, lawyers and in power, p p powerful positions, not only in Germany, but around the world. And so it, it didn't happen like that, but it was a persistent campaign uh, for the purpose of, uh, of, of destroying the Jews. And so can the same thing happen again? We say, well, no, it can't happen again because, <laughs> because uh, it, you know, we learned from World War II and we were, of course, if, 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 
if we always learn the lesson, that saying wouldn't be out there, that those who, do, who fail to learn the lessons of history are doomed to repeat its mistakes. Absolutely. It continues to happen. Sure. And the amazing thing there is that endured through World War II to an extent. And, no, you know, I won't say nobody made the connection, but the people that could have done something about it didn't make the connection. Sure. So it, it can, what, what breaks it? Let me, let me, instead of keep repeating the same stuff, what breaks this generation or this generational sin? And I, I do, again, I, I think the, you may hear the term if you've never, if you've heard it before, maybe you've not, but generational sin. There, there's, there's kind of an idea of generational sin in different uh, cultures. And as we've seen already in scripture, certainly in, in those generations, oftentimes, you know, it, it it can it can affect a generation adversely for a long time. What breaks it? See, Hannah David is salvation. It's always the same, and so just as much as we can sit back and say, "Well, they they're not learning the mistakes of history," well, Christians don't either because we can jump in the middle of it with the wrong answer. The the right answer is Christ. That's the fundamental answer is Christ. People need the Lord. Uh, that's what's going to break it now. I think what the, the picture that scripture paints is it's going to be more and more difficult because we, and it's one of the indicators why we, we know that we're in the last days because it is becoming more and more difficult. Second Timothy chapter four, it tells us it's going to be difficult. There's going to come a time when people will not listen, having itching ears. They're not going to, they're not going to listen to the gospel anymore. They're not going to listen to sound doctrine. They will not tolerate one translation says sound doctrine. Uh, because they have those itching ears. And the only alternative to sound doctrine is stuff like we're looking at right here. It, it leads to chaos. It leads to spiritual chaos. And spiritual chaos leads to people slipping into eternity without Jesus Christ. That's an awful high cost. So what do we do? Yeah, we have to be we have to be salt and light to the world. We have to know Christ, and we have to uh, put, we have to keep preaching the gospel. We have to be living the gospel. We have to be preaching the gospel. We have to be uh, communicating the gospel in everything that we do, because uh, that's that's the antidote. All right, comments or questions, eleven to fourteen. Yes. Yeah. Good. Uh, it was mentioned. I'm not doing a very good job of repeating this stuff, but uh, that we we need to make sure that we're treating we're we're training the next generation, uh, so that they see the dangers of of these things, because the more it becomes commonplace and accepted. Uh, the easier it's going to be for the next generation to just slip right into it. Anyone else? Fifteen. The leech has two daughters. Give and give. That mean? Anybody ever had a leech? Leech? Anybody ever had a leech on it before? That's all they do. That's, that's all they do. Uh, and that's what it means. A leech, it appears that its only purpose is to drink blood. And maybe you're not as familiar with leeches, but maybe you're familiar with ticks. You live in the country and had dogs or found animals that had ticks on them. Some of those ticks are pretty big because all they do is suck blood. 
That's all they, that's what they just want. Give, give. So why is that in here? Well, we've got some more to go in the verse. There are three things that are never satisfied. Four, never say enough. The grave, the barren womb, the earth that is not satisfied with water, and the fire never says enough. So what's all that mean? The leech uh, and the, uh, the three things that are four things that never say enough. Singing. Okay. Uh, the, yeah. What'd you say? Preach to human nature. Okay. In what ways? Uh, <laughs> well, put Marty on the spot. People who are never satisfied. Okay. Okay. Discontent. Okay. Okay. Somebody help hand up over here. Well, some people love death. This abortion thing right now. They love death. It's not theirs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you know, going back to eleven through fourteen, you can you can see that in a lot of what's been going on the last couple of weeks is, you know, the whole uh, the whole like, abortion thing is. Bad enough in and of itself, but some of the things that have been going on the last few weeks and the marches and rallies with bloody baby dolls and stuff like that is uh, it's terrifying. It's it's evil. Okay. You know, I think of one recent one was the baby formula thing. You know, people will actually go into a store and take everything that they can possibly give, get without thinking of the other person who also needs that same thing. I think in the early stages of the uh, of, of COVID, when there was so much hoarding going on, people going out and buying stuff up needlessly. Right. Exactly. But to turn around and make a profit off make a profit, of what right. they've done. You know, I mean, it's, it's just simple. All right, so yeah, the idea is uh, going back to I think uh, Randy hit her, hit it really on the head here. It's it's about just discontent, or you can even say greed. Uh, they're all illustrations of, of greed in a sense. I think we say that you know, so that doesn't really equate here, but all greed is is I won't. Uh, there's not enough. Okay, I, there's there's not enough, um, and. All of these things illustrate that the grave is never going to be satisfied, and that's a that's a sobering thought. It's for some people, it's a scary thought. Uh, depending on the translation, you might have sheol. Sheol is just a, a euphemism for the grave. Um, but people, it, it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. The grave's not going to be satisfied, if you will, until. Uh, the new heaven and new earth are ushered in and death is taken out of the way. Death is done. Uh, and that's just incomprehensible to us. Uh, the barren womb, I, you know, I think the, the people that would like to have children and can't are the ones that have the grasp on that. We, 
we, we never, you know, we never, we never had to try to have a baby. I was, I, I kind of chuckle. I don't chuckle. I, I don't want to come off insensitive. I don't know people are trying to have a baby. Uh, it was always the other way around. Oh, we're having a baby. Oh, well, we didn't try to have a baby, but we're having a baby. Yeah, because, and that's, the Lord gave us four children. Praise the Lord for that. I can't imagine life without those children. But some people can't have children. And uh, they have a better grasp on that little three-word statement in verse 16 than anybody else does. Uh, and, and it's an illustration of, of wanting but not being able to produce or wanting and not being able to give. The earth is never satisfied with water, I think, is, is interesting because, uh, you know, when we look at the backdrop of this, again, as a, uh, an agricultural society and the crops always need water, you, can, you can't really water them enough. I mean, technically you can, but you know what I mean, that uh, when water is hard to come by and over there, water today is still hard to come by. As I said, we were there. I was there almost three weeks. I never saw it rain. Never, never once. I think one time. There were a few drops that came out of the, but there was a flock of birds flying over too. So who knows? Um, uh, so <laughs> that's, that's true. So uh, same thing and fire. Yeah. You know, as, as long as the fire is burning, it'll keep, it'll keep consuming fuel. And so I can't remember who said it. I apologize, but somebody said it's a, it's an illustration of the, the mentality of, of man. Uh, we want, we want, we want, we want uh, our whole society and, and our whole culture and history is, uh, you know, rotates around wanting more or wanting different. Otherwise, new things wouldn't be invented uh, and new, new, new frontiers wouldn't try to be conquered. And uh, we always want more and we always want different. And uh, JC was was making the point that the only thing that brings satisfaction is our relationship with the Lord. And that's the only place we're going to find satisfaction. It's the only place we can try to find true contentment. And that's what God calls us to is contentment. Uh, as Randy said, uh, and, and we struggle to be content. Like Jesus said to the woman at the well, having living water, Yeah, it would, it would thirst no more. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone else? Yeah, I think that's a great connection too. In Matthew six, uh, the things we have need of, God is willing to provide. Uh, the problem is we're not content with the things what God wants to provide. We don't want just what we have need of. We want more, which is the whole point of this. We want more. And it really, and, that, and that's a, you know, it's a great, that's a great observation on an application to our current situation. We got to go buy everything because what if God forgets to send what we need? God's going to provide what we need. Now, it doesn't mean you don't, Practice wisdom and doesn't, you know, things like that. I, I get it. It's, it's not an either or. We, we continue to be wise. We're going to see that in the next chapter. This, this uh, virtuous woman who prepares and we've seen in the past in Proverbs about go to the ant, you sluggard, who stores up the, the food for winter. So it's not talking about not making wise prepos, prep, prep, preparations. <laughs> Uh, it's not talking about throwing wisdom out the window, but at the same time, it, it is talking about um, making all those decisions uh, in conjunction with the Lord. Yeah. Good. She said that uh, it, it illustrates where we are as people, where sin has left us. Everything's tainted by sin, uh, even our desire. We're not, and part of our sin nature is not to be content. Um, 
And you think about that, as, as Carol says, I'm thinking about Jesus being tempted in the wilderness. And those things were, were all things that are designed to really play on Christ's humanity. Um, and this very thing we're talking about here. You know, we haven't eaten in 40 days. We'll turn these stones to bread. You have the ability to do that. Uh, man is not. Uh, thank you, man. Man does not live. I got it wrong. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And so, while we usually focus on the back and forth about the scripture, it is also dealing with what Carol was just talking about, going to the humanity of Christ and just our natural desire to have a second bowl of ice cream because one is not enough. Yeah, you're gonna vote for that. Oh, <laughs> well, your son would. <laughs> Good point. Good point. The leech has two daughters. Give and give. I never looked at it like that. That's excellent. Did you hear what he said? He says the leech has two daughters. So the leech, the parent. Takes his two daughters and teaches it to want, 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 uh, you know. And the leech does what it's, uh, what it's designed to do, what it's made to do, what comes by instinct. So it teaches its daughters to do what comes by instinct. Uh, in our, and this kind of connects with what Carol was saying. In our sin nature, just in our natural sin state, we're going to teach, unfortunately, we're going to teach our children. We're going to pass down a heritage of sin unless it's interrupted by God's grace. And that's the only thing that can interrupt and overcome uh, our sinful state is the, is the grace of God. And then we have the opportunity to train up our children in the way they should go. So when they're not old, they will not depart from it instead of give, give. Very good, Steve. Anyone else? What a mess. I mean, and again, you, you start to look at their lives and not to, not to judge their lives, but just look and, and see. I saw that Elon Musk, see, I couldn't even get it straight because everybody's trying to be politically correct. I said, Elon does, Musk's daughter is transgender and changed her name, but I found out it was Elon Musk's son that is transitioning to female and changing their name because they don't want to be associated with their father anymore. That's a long way to go just to poke your thumb in your father's eye. You know? uh, but you're right. They, the, the, the people we look to or that society looks to, it's give, give. There's never enough. I, I can't, I always get, I need to look it up and confirm it in my brain, whether it was Rockefeller or, uh, Getty, but I think it was Rockefeller. They said, well, how much is enough? And he said, just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. You know, a guy, Todd York, there's Todd York Road there, yeah. and he lives out in the town, and someone asked him, he said, he told him, he said, well, you always buy in blocks, you wouldn't want it all, because, you know, old grandma cut your line. <laughs> and... It's amazing, isn't it? One man. Now, let me go back to those two statements, uh, Rockefeller and just a little bit more and just the ground that touches mine. Both of these are matters of perspective. Now, we can look at it from a biblical perspective and shake our head. Much of the world would say, that is very wise. That, that is very smart. Especially, I think especially that second one. Well, you just, yeah, that makes sense. Get all the ground that touches yours. And from a purely business standpoint, it is. But from, from a spiritual standpoint, it illustrates just exactly what we're talking about here. Give, give. Never say enough. 
All right, we'll pick up on 17 next week. I'm going to try to end on a uplifting note, but 17 is the birds are plucking out the eyeballs, so that's not uplifting either. So, so <laughs> we'll start on that one next week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight. Thank you for your word and uh, the warnings it gives us. As believers, we shouldn't struggle with these things. These, these are... These are things that are connected to the fall and things that are connected to our sin nature. And certainly, Father, when we're willing, we can elect instead to walk in your spirit and to be filled with your spirit and to give our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to you, which is our spiritual service of worship and not be consumed with uh, the pursuit of more and more and more. Father, help us to instead be salt and light to the earth to demonstrate that uh, we can be content and, and not mirror the, uh, the attitudes of the world uh, and show them that there is genuinely a difference uh, in, in the lives that have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Father, I lift up the Georgine family to you and especially Pete as he struggles with this illness and for Rick and Norma as I know that it's just agonizing for them to have lost uh, one son and and to contemplate uh, the possibility that uh, another is very ill. Lord, we pray that you minister to, to their hearts, that you give them your peace that surpasses understanding. And uh, Father, that uh, if it be your will, that you just uh, deliver Pete from this and uh, just help him to see his, his need for you. We thank you for your love and your great grace in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Thank you all.